Welcome to the Elijah Winfrey Show. I'm your host, Elijah Winfrey, joined each week by my fabulous, wonderful, and very talented co-host, Tony Boucher. We have a great show lined up for you today. Um, Our guest this week uh, is an outstanding individual, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, we confirmed to have her on the show, but we had technical difficulties um, on both sides, and we were not able to make that happen. But this week, we have her here live. And we can't wait to get going with her. But before we get to our guest today, let's get you caught up on the past week and weekend that was for Tony and I. Tony, how have you been? What have you been up to? Yeah, you know, I've been wonderful. I'm in Wyoming visiting my parents. And so I'm doing a, a, a month here to help them with, um, you know, some stuff at their place. And so I'm, I'm doing a working vacation. And it's been a lot of fun to spend time with all the family and um, have a different environment for my work. I've been working a lot on uh, getting uh, some things coordinated for um, residential support for families is something I've been working on a lot lately. Is, and as we all know, we talked about last week with our fabulous guest, what an important uh, you know resource that is to make sure people have support they need once they get get out of high school. So I've been doing a lot of work on that. Eli, how are you doing? What's been going on in your, your direction? I know we had talked about taking it easy. Did you succeed? Well, um, yes and a no. Um, so I, I had a tournament this past weekend, and, and uh, I did okay. You know, my, my elbow held up um, okay. I finished ninth, which was good. Um, but, you nice. know, the body sends signals to me sometimes to, to kind of let me know that, you know, my <clears throat> my playing career is is definitely winding down, you know. Um, there are times during the tournament this weekend where I just felt like, you know, maybe this is this is it for, you know, the rest of the season, you know. Um, I, I can't fully extend my arm and I can't completely bend it, you know. Um, and it's something – that happened in Palm Springs last last year, as I as I stated uh, in, in past shows, and uh, same injury, and it it really puts things in perspective. And as far as me playing, um, or how long I'm going to prolong my my playing career, and you know, I, I talked to my wife about um, these decisions, and and I, I'd had a decision set on on when I was going to stop playing, uh, and it fluctuates, you know, because sometimes I play really well, and then I say, well, you know, I think I can keep going, and then, you know, the body says, well, let's not let's not get too far ahead of yourself, you know. Um, you're not recovering completely, you know, uh, at, at a rate that is healthy and wise for you to continue to, to kind of swing a club at that rate of speed and, and have your body twist and turn. So, uh, you know, I should know for sure by October whether I'm going to continue to play, you know, going into next season or not. But um, all in all, it, it was good. PGA Junior League, which my nonprofit sponsors a team, uh, started uh, last week. And so they're off and running and, and doing really well. And uh, if, if I could just quickly shout out a, a friend of, of the show, um, his name is Melvin Palmer. And, and uh he lives in Georgia, and he's he's a childhood friend, and and to this day, you know, I I feel like I'm I'm pretty close. We we don't speak a lot because of the distance, uh, but uh, he's been a great guy. He's always been a great guy, and you know, I, I always consider myself close to, to to people like Melvin, who who get it, who understand life and the journey, and uh, I've been grateful to have uh, him become a fan of the show. Uh, but more importantly, his friendship has been invaluable. So I, I'm I'm pretty blessed to to have a friend like that. And and you know I I found out he listened to the show from my sister who kind of relayed that message to me and and uh, made me smile. And uh, it, you know it it just lets me know that you know even though you don't keep in contact with with friends all the time, like you know those true friends out there who who really still support what you do and love what you do are, are still there and, and present and. Uh, and that means a lot to me, so I wanted to, to shout uh, shout him out. So that's Amen. basically, uh, yeah. So that that's basically it. That's that's my week. I did spend time with the family, and and school's winding up here, 
for for our little guy, and uh, his last day is Thursday. But unfortunately, I'll be in Springfield, Missouri, <laughs> on Thursday, so I'll miss that part. But uh, he's excited about summer, and he's sad that school's ending. Something that I used to never say. Yeah, yeah. isn't that great? Doesn't that make you happy? My son is worried. My son is worried that we're not going to get back from our vacation in time for him to be on time to school. He doesn't want to miss any days. <laughs> so we've had to print out a, a calendar so that he can actually see that you know school doesn't start for him until August twenty, and we're still in June. So, yeah, it's great that That's our kids want to want to keep you know keep it going. That's Absolutely. Indeed. Indeed. Enough about us, Tony. Let's get to our guest today. Uh, yeah. You know, she really needs no introduction, if if you ask me. And, uh, you know, I, I've read the work that she's done. And, you know, we we met on social media. You, you know how I am. I, I kind of scroll through my news feed or I'll see something that's intriguing and and, and really positive, and I want to try to connect. Doesn't always happen, mm-hmm. but uh, this connection did, and and I think I'm I'm all the better for it. Um, you know, Holly Bridges, uh, she does great work um, in Australia and around the world, and she's been gracious enough to join the show today. And Holly, thank you so much for for taking the time to to be on the show. I know it's pretty late there in Australia. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to be on your show. And yes, it is quite early. It's 2 a.m. here, so it's dark and cold, <laughs> but it's, um, it's a real pleasure. We're so glad you would be here with us today. I think, you know, Eli introduced you and used the word intriguing for for um, some of the people on social media, and, and I would say that that is a great word um, to just describe you because what you do is a little bit different than what you know what is common out there in the world of of supporting folks and and so I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk with you today about you know more specifically what it is that you you do work on yeah thank you it's um it is a bit different and sometimes it's quite it's been quite hard to articulate it because it is so it's just subtly different from a lot of work, and then the work itself is quite subtle. But uh, usually, when I start talking, um, you can't shut me up. <laughs> so we'll, um, <laughs> we'll get just, started. Um, we, you know, ramble around. Share with it. yeah, share with our audience what it is that you know what your specialty focus has been. I know a lot of it has to do with the vagus nerve, and just talk with us about what you do because it is going to be different than what we've had on the show. Uh, you know, since I've been here anyway. So we won't right. show sure, up. Right. Sure. We want to hear. <laughs> well, I might just give you a little potted version first to to um, explain myself. I think I I um, I work with the vagal nerve, and it's from a um, a theory by an American neurobiologist called Dr. Stephen Porges. Um, I fell in love with this theory. It's it's quite it's starting to get quite well known internationally, not just for autism, but for a range of human experiences. So uh, things like bipolar and depression and schizophrenia. He's trying to understand and explain how the nervous system, the brain and the body, talk to each other. And he has this wonderful theory that's much more of a systems model, and it it kind of takes the sting out of things. So instead of, we we blindly sort of say a lot of these things are more or less a brain deficit or there's something wrong with the brain. And what he's doing is stretching it out to explore the possibility that it's very much more about the nervous system and how the mind and body talk. And when we get into a certain physiological state, it's very hard to access our executive functioning and our eyes and our ears and our voice. And this is a, it's just a revolutionary way of looking at it. And then it isn't, which is what's interesting with the, you know, what we were saying about my work is that it's, we do play with the nervous system. We do do um, horse therapy and, and all sorts of different body sensory therapies. But I think we don't take it quite as far as we can because we still see autism in the deficit model, but a very much a brain deficit model. And I, I find a glass ceiling with that. You can only go so far. 
So I looked at uh, other practitioners around the world, like Anat Banyel, who's in my book, and, and saw that there were people doing really interesting work um, that you know, often the diagnosis can get reversed. Often a lot of the symptoms can be ameliorated. And I really wondered how. And so I found this theory and wrote the book. And it's, the publishers picked it up in basically a two days. So we're really excited. And since then I've just started developing my work. So it's, it's because you're working with the body, I, I work with people in their 40s. I have a lot of teenagers I work with. I work with 20-year-olds. Um, often who've done sort of they've done every therapy under the sun for their whole lives and it's worked enough but not quite and then they come and do this and it actually is exponentially interesting for them which I find fascinating I just pinch myself a lot because I'm quite amazed that it can have that level of um, change for people but it works equally well for people who are non-verbal and five and I have such a range of clients, but because I'm working with the body rather than the mind, although the mind's involved because the, the person has to be very much involved in what you're doing and give permission and be integrated in it, it it's, it's still easier for them because you're not asking too much of their mind, which is already rather busy. What I wanted to ask you, um, Holly, is... You know, and we're talking about reframe your thinking around autism. What is there anything that you left out of the book that you wanted to um, add to the book? Was, was it was it so much information that, that that there are things that you you didn't put in the book that that you maybe wanted to, or maybe down the road it, there will be another one? Yes, down the road there will be another one. So that book. It, it needed to be really simple. The theory itself, if you try and read Stephen Porges' book, is a tomb. <laughs> and if you look on the internet, people write, yawn, I fell asleep, it, like it's really dense because it has to be. It's appropriately scientific and intricate. So I've done the Dr. Zeus version in my book. So it's much more accessible and it's just enough. So I have a lot. I've, at the end of the book, I give some um, ideas for therapies and I've added mine in now that I've developed it. But, but it's enough for people to just reframe it. It's such a huge thing to start looking at this. So I often have people say, geez, I wish you'd put this much in and this and this and this. But I, I think the simplicity of it matters first. And when you, when you can really understand that, and it's actually kind of harder than you think because we're so used to thinking in a certain way and then working with people in a certain way, which is often very right. directive. It's often very outcomes-focused. And you have to learn to really pull back and get out of the way and trust the fact that the person actually, their body-mind sophistication is very, very strong even if they can't talk and have faith in that, and that's what you're working with. So reframing that for people is huge, and it's enough. So I, I like the simplicity of my lovely little book. It, it's, you know, it's tiny, but, but it's accessible. It's not, it's not dominating for people intellectually so they can groove into it, and I, I think it's enough. Well, and people do okay. have to really, really shift how they think about things because I, I agreed with what you said about people thinking of, of autism and other conditions as a brain issue, and that's not how our bodies function. We are an integrated whole, and 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 so really paying attention to what the body does in conjunction to what the mind is doing is so important. And getting people to really be aware of that is just such a huge, important you know message to get across. And you know, Annette Bennell's work. Uh, I, I love what she does. It's, it's very subtle. But again, it's getting people to really be aware of that body awareness. The work I do, it, it has a lot to do with body awareness as well, and that's what I find is successful uh, because the mind is very busy. So I, I really support exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, there, there's so many people doing such lovely work uh, around this area internationally we, we're we just starting to find language for it. And I think that's why I really like the polyvagal model because it, it allows us to have a, a, a model, a systems model for it mm -hmm. instead of this sort of very abstract brain deficit model, which, which we pretty well go to. 
Um, whereas, you know, everyone says autism, autism is a mystery. We, you know, we can't solve it. We have that puzzle kind of image, which doesn't work for me. And it doesn't work for a whole lot of people on the spectrum. They find it quite affronting, as you know. Um, so this, this allows a much more um, gentle way of thinking about it and then working with people, as you say. So I, I might, for your listeners, just give you a very potted version of the polyvagal theory because the word is you know it's such a funny old word anyway all it really is is looking at how the body goes into shutdown as a defensive mode we have um, different safety responses and we can either socially engage with people and that's our sort of um, highest evolutionary ability and in order to do that we have to it's actually a physiological thing to be able to use your eyes and your voice and your your body, shake hands with people, make eye contact. All of that's very much a, a physiological thing that we do when we're in a really good space, in a parasympathetic space. When we um, might have a level of threat come towards us that smoothing things over doesn't work, we can go in, we go into flight or fight or sort of a pretend to freeze kind of option where the the whole body system gets quite raised and we get excited and and, um, the cortisol and adrenaline and everything sort of starts to go up and on. The eyes get rigid, the ears start listening for danger and the body's gone into a kind of a phase which we learn to deal with and and work with with our mind. But what Dr. Porges says is that there's another level where we the body will take over like a rabbit in a headlights. It, it, it will shut us down if the level of threat coming towards us is too much. And so then we don't have any choice. Our eyes and our ears and our voice don't work and we can sort of, you know, to the point that we can faint, but we certainly freeze and can't speak. Like when you get stage fright or when you have right. grief, your body just really shuts you down and you kind of can't do anything about it except trying to work yourself up and up and out of it again but you you almost have to wait till you warm up half the time because it's it's happened without you meaning it to and this is his point is that we've sort of forgotten that and we don't discuss it in psychology and medicine very much yet it's very much a human part of our um our our, our functioning our facility it's a very useful part of our facility you wouldn't not want to have it but perhaps with autism People have been kind of um, born or not long after because we really don't know exactly what autism is and there's such a range. But perhaps they've been born in that physiological state where they've, that's what they know. If you've, if you've been born in kind of a fairly, um, your body's gone into that kind of shutdown state and all of that social software has been depressed and stuck, you think that's normal and that's your baseline for going about the world. My thesis is, and, you know, and other people, is that you can teach that a, a new baseline to someone. So if, they, if their body thinks that's all there is, you actually teach their body how to relax just that bit more and soften and all of those um, abilities can come back online and slowly warm up. And that's, that's what I see all of the time. It's absolutely fascinating and it's why it doesn't matter what sort of intellectual capacity the person has because you're working with this really subliminal, fundamental, but very simple part of your body system and it wakes back up again. So I have people who are nonverbal and five who start talking and, and coping and interacting better at this very quickly, very easily because we've just worked with the body. Um, it's a it's a really really different model, and I think the difference. I, I always try and work out what the difference is with my work because it because it is a little different. And I think one of the things is I work just with that, rather than. I think it's a bit ad hoc when we do a, you know horse therapy or dog therapy and things. We we know we're playing in that arena. But we don't specifically just work with that. We have all of this other stuff which takes the brain's attention. But when you just work with that with the body, the the brain has a lot more time just to focus. And then you're Mm. teaching that person how to learn that stillness 
which is really, really hard for people on the spectrum. So I do this exercise, which is... Um, it's a very, very simple exercise with a with a fit ball, a big gym ball, and you just lie on the floor and put your feet on the ball and pedal. And you know, there's more to it, but but essentially, it's a fairly physiologically simple process. But I can't tell you how hard it is for some people because when they lie down and try and do that, it's almost impossible for them a to tell their legs what to do. Their brain and their body don't talk so well and they're, they're sort of disconnected because when you go into a really um, immobilized state, the brain stops talking to the body so much. It's switched off. So it's quite hard for them to do it and often they're very agitated because the body's kind of in that revved state. So you're, you're sort of wooing the system to learn how to settle and you really can only do that by being extremely kind to people because they need to be safe because the whole the whole system is actually set up about safety. And then they need to help give permission and then they need, need to be part of the process enough so they're actually really learning and in charge because what you're teaching them is mastery of their body as well as stillness. It's really interesting. I absolutely love this because one of the, you know, one of my mantras has always been address sensory issues, anxiety, any kind of physical underlying health problems that can cause pain first because a lot of times we do things backwards. We go in and try to teach social skills or teach how to do, you know, how to communicate with your, you know, with your words and your body language. And none of us can do that in fight, flight, or freeze state. And so I think this is really, really important what you're saying, and it's not about your functioning level or, you know, can you talk or not. It's about establishing a new baseline for people that allows them to reach whatever their potential is, because none of us can reach our potential when we're in that heightened state. So I think this is really, really, uh, really good stuff. It's hugely important. And, 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 and then to add to that, if you have someone working with you who can see you and not just sees your struggle but sees the inherent sophistication of your system and knows that there's a whole person in there because because it doesn't matter if you can't talk or do all of this functional whatever, there's still a whole human being in there and I, that's why I love this theory the most. It really allows for that. So it's very empowering to... A, just come from that space with someone, but also, you know, I explain it to people. I explain it to five-year-old kids via their mother, and they listen. You know they're listening. Um, so that they know, I know, you know, at a, at a proper level that they're, they're in there and they're part of the process. It's so empowering. And I, I, I explain, I mean, I do all my wacky old, stick figure drawings and things. I'll, I'll send you one to put up if you like. I, I, it's a really nice image. It's not in the book. But I show this to, you know, 20-year-old kids who fly over to see me to, to do, like, an intensive for five days. And they just go, you know, that actually explains me. And I think that's the difficulty with a lot of ways we explain autism is it really misses the point for people on the spectrum. I also consider myself on the spectrum, so I think I come at it at quite a unique way as well because I really get it and I get how you're, you can't access, you know, you can't talk sometimes or your face goes completely blank and people think you're really mean, but you're not. You've just gone blank. Straight so forward. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really... Um, it's it's hugely empowering for people to um, be witnessed at that level, and then and then you work with them at that level. It's it's it, that's quite a different model too. I I find often. Outstanding. What 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 I want to know um, is tell me about your your passion for for doing the work that you do. Where where did it come from? Where did it start? <laughs> Um, it's funny, I, um, I was watching something quite some years ago now, uh, um, like a TED Talk or something, and it, this guy was talking something like, um, you might as well just get on with who you actually are because that's the best 
you, you might as well just give the world what you are and stop judging mm. whether it's good or bad and just go be weird. Oh, and I wow. went, oh, that's a good idea. So I, I've kind of really embraced that. And I, 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 I came across autism because I met a family with autism. And I, I work with people, I mean, I always have with, um, with the body and brain plasticity and, and le- special you know, learning difficulties and things. But I hadn't really looked at it. And when I met this family, um, the dad had autism and the 15-year-old boy had autism. And I went, well, I'm so much like that. You know, they're very, very functioning, mm-hmm. extremely bright people, but, you know, in certain circumstances, boom, they, they're not operating at their peak. And so I started exploring it. And I really didn't like a lot of what I read, and I, I didn't really like a lot of what the therapies were. I, I feel like they're missing something, you know, and, and I really do now. Um, so I, I just started exploring, and I found the polyvagal theory, and then I, then I found Annette Danielle, and... I I just got really excited because you know it was that one of those really big light bulb moments where thank goodness someone's actually saying something that makes sense that we all know it's you know there's nothing new in the universe we actually all really know this but we don't we haven't had a model for it for so long because we've got such a Western brain and we think that you know have a, the mind is its thing all by itself like you know in future armor or something that's just in a jar. Whereas it's not, it's very, very integral to the the whole body system, and we're we're a being and a mammal, as much as anything else. So, so I did a workshop and I presented to these mothers, and they just went, "Thank you so much. We finally have some hope." And we always leave these workshops feeling so bad about ourselves, and we actually, you know, feel like there's somewhere to go here. So I, you know, and they went, we want something to read. So I wrote the book and, and got permission from Stephen Porges and, and Annette Danielle and sent it to a London publisher who took it straight away. Um, and then I, then I wanted to see if I could work with people because I hadn't specifically done that. So I went to work in autism services for a few years here and I started off as a support and then I was a coordinator and then I did this wonderful project but it was really eye-opening for me um, to, to A, engage with a lot of people and really see myself. I, I first up was working with this chap that no one would work with um, and he was, you know, I'm five foot, he was huge. <laughs> we got on so well. We had this wonderful time. You know, I, I ended up being nominated for an award for it and Honestly, it wasn't that hard to do. It was just meeting him at that level. And it changed him because he was treated as though he was intelligent and whole, regardless of all his personal circumstances. And, and it, was, it was lovely, but it taught me more about myself than the other way around. Um, right. So I, I kind of I gained a lot. I also looked at what was happening in the industry really well. Okay. And I also, with the people I worked with, would you know, and especially the really good support staff, when you treat someone well and they're safe, they function better. They just yeah. do. And when they don't, they seize up. So it's like that's the mechanism in action. That's the polyvagal theory in action. It's like it is actually real. How do you tinker with that? So I started finding ways to help people soften, whether it was in the swimming pool, throwing the ball to each other and, and saying your name just fun stuff because they're relaxed they're in the pool they love it and then they're doing that and then you say to them hey look how your voice is working better when you're doing this so i think actually you can probably talk way better than you think you can and just that sort of stuff just playing with that um it gives it gives the person this self-awareness and facility that they didn't have before because people don't language that for them because they they're X, Y, Z, and they're always going to be that. But I figure, who knows who people can be? You don't know where people can go and how much they can change. Um, exactly. And we really have a glass ceiling with autism, you know. So, so I just that I just I got more and more passionate about it. But I also was mm, not stymied, but the role could only take me so far. So I started doing private therapeutic work and just developing my practice to the point where I just I transferred to doing it full time and 
you know, I I was in Seattle last year. Um, you were talking about friends at the beginning of your show. I I love finding people that love the polyvagal theory, and I I had a call from the Asperger experts. You must know them in Seattle. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. astounding chaps, um, Danny Rady Absolutely. and Travis Monson. Um, so they they called me because they read my book, and it's been very affirming to have. Um, have friends and other people who support what I'm doing um, because it is a little left of centre as well. I can't quite remember why I went there. Um, but it, 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 it it's helped um, generate kind of support. And then I, I went over to Seattle. So it, it, it was lovely to, um, to start making this really international network of people who are... Um, hugely interested in changing the paradigm of of autism and you know like you it's guys really with show huge i think that there's there's a lot of resonation out there particularly in the you know in the adult autistic community i would i would say that that it's really an important move as a whole you know to get to that space of, of looking at people's potential and not seeing so much pathology I, I I loved what you said about getting people in the pool and throwing a ball. A trampoline, I find, works really well in music. Uh, it's something I utilize a lot, and it's the same principle that you're talking about. I'm wondering if you have a, a piece of advice that you could give our families today, something really quick and easy that they could do with you know somebody that they love on the spectrum to help start to reset that baseline. Any advice for our listeners? It's it's really interesting because we so often come from a a do it model or a what can I get mm-hmm. them to do model, mm-hmm. um, and it's tempting because you know it's, especially as therapists then we can say well I achieved something today and you can tick a box and justify getting paid, but mm-hmm. it's not useful necessarily as you well know. Um, so. I'm tempted to pull back from that. I I, I often I'll, I'll show. I did it yesterday. I, like I showed a mum one of my exercises, and you know it's this ball one. It's very very simple, but the point isn't the exercise. The point is to get yourself into a space that's soft and open, which is easier said than done for someone on the spectrum. So that's actually the point is to Love feel it. that grace. And so what I'm what I'm tempted to, to say as advice for parents is more really um step back, listen to your child and 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 um really know for yourself that you operate better when you're in a good state, when you're in a parasympathetic state. And be kind to yourself from that first. I think it's really important to come from that space, which which is hard sometimes because life gets very difficult. But the more you can come from that space with your child, the more you engage them at that level and you have faith in them just because mm. and you have faith in them that they actually know a whole lot more than you think they do, even if it doesn't look like it today. Allowing for that space for the person generates so much goodness and beauty, and we have to start from there. And it's it's actually quite beautiful, and it isn't as simple as it sounds. But it, it's it I find it's faster. It's actually faster, and then there's an authenticity to it. There's a relationship to it, and the the person that you live with, you love, you're working with, feels that because we're all mammals mm-hmm. and we like to feel safe. So, so my advice is always be, as a parent, be really kind to yourself and nurture yourself first, because then you can come from that space. Beautiful. I, I love that. Yeah. So do I. I love it. Now, now before we, before we let you go, what what are you up to? What's next for you? What 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 does the summer look like? Are you going to be traveling? You know, to the states. I'm really hoping. I, I've I've got a DVD out that I made in Seattle last year. So I just thought to remember to say that for people because it's got my workshop on it and it's got exercises that you can do, like this ball one that I've been talking about. So it's, it's, it's a really good way of an introduction. 
Um, and that's available um, on my website, um, which which www.zebr.co, um, which we can put up. But uh, as well as that, I've, I'm hoping to come to Seattle later this year or the beginning of next year to start my training program because... Um, there's just one of me and I want to start expanding it. I've got a lot of people wanting to learn it. So hopefully I'll be there. I've got a university in New Jersey, in New York, who are looking to do some research on my work. So I'm I'm trying to kind of hook that up um, for the next, towards the end of the year, at least the beginning of next year. So perhaps another US tour. And I'll be in Ireland and the UK again next April. So, so I've just got home and recovered <laughs> from the last <laughs> year, which was wonderful but huge. I, I did a thing in Boston with our surgery expert um, and went to New York and then Ireland. Um, so I've, I'm starting to get busy and I'm starting to be on the move. My kids are a bit older mm-hmm. now, so I, I've got a bit more room to go running around the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it has been a pleasure. Um, you know, I know the listeners have been educated as well as Tony and I. Thank you so, so much for, for getting up um, as early as you did to, to be on the show and calling a day sooner. Um, you know, I, I really i am blessed and, and uh, we, we're fortunate to have you on. And uh, th- you, you always have a platform with us. So, so whenever you have something that you want to promote or get out there, please don't hesitate to, to, to tweet me or, or Facebook me. And I'll be sure to do my best to promote it, and uh, we definitely want you to come back on the show very soon. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. Really nice to talk to you both. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. You take care, okay? Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Very educational show today, once again. That was fantastic. um, Yes, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm always blown away, and I'm sitting here taking notes, right down things as, as, mm-hmm. as she's talking, and you know, this is what it's all about. You know, you see people in the world who are who are all about, you know, changing uh, things and, and making someone or something better, and Holly definitely does that, and uh, and 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 all it takes is just to scroll through social media, and you see these. You see these wonderful images of, of people mm-hmm. really doing hard work, and it gets missed because we cover so much negativity in the world. And I'm not saying that uh, we, we shouldn't be up on 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 what's what's bad, but you know there are a lot of people who are trying to change that narrative, and yeah. uh, she's definitely trying to do that. Yeah, this is a perfect example of that. And I just nobody could see me, but I was like jumping up and down and smiling really big <laughs> when she talked about you know. People have this idea you have to do something, and that is the model we use. And I loved that she said, just step back and give some space, be gentle with yourself, and and have that space where you give people permission to really just be. I I think that's a wonderful, very wise piece of advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, she, she also mentioned, you know, the part where she was saying, you know, when you treat them kindly, Right, things really open up mm-hmm. for them, you it's know. Not and I think science, that's but, yes, yeah, it is so important, and and we tend to forget that. We do. It's you know when we when we pathologize, we lose sight of the humanity of. But when we we put them into pathologizing categories, and so that message I think is really, like she said, it's not rocket science. It's something we've always known, but it is so important to to keep that front and center in any kind of therapy you do, any kind of interaction, any kind of anything that you do. With, with Absolutely. Yourself. Absolutely. Great guess. Before we go, Tony, um, what are you going to be up to this week? I, I know that you, you work in from afar. Um, what's the rest of the week look like for you? Yeah, well, just spending really quality time with family and, you know, doing my work, um, at the same time, I'm, I'm looking out my parents' front window at some beautiful Arabian horses, and I see this big Wyoming sky with some clouds, and it's just really a lovely environment to be in. So I'm really going to take some time to really just enjoy where I'm at. How about you, Eli? 
Oh, that sounds awesome. You know, that's one of those images. I'm trying to picture that in my head, you know, just sitting outside and just letting your mind wander. Um, for me, um, I, I won't do much this week because I'm getting ready to travel to Springfield um, um, toward the end of this week. So I'll, I'll take it easy and continue to recover, rehab, uh, hang out with the family, uh, and, you know, let my mind wander a bit. You know, it, it, I think it's Good. it's healthy to kind of, you know, open your mind and kind of release, you know, some of the things that, that you maybe are thinking about or maybe stressing about. So I'll, I'll do We're some of that We're going to take Holly's sure. advice. You and I are going to take Holly's advice, and we're going to do this for ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. It sounds like I love yeah. it. I love it. Well, folks, that's that's about it for the show today. Uh, we didn't get to questions of the week, but we will at some point. Uh, next week's guest uh, is Jessica Kent. And Jessica Kent is an outstanding individual that uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting through the first year grade of Seattle. 